Maybe we should then just get started with the questions that were sent in beforehand. What do you think, Lisa? I think that's a great idea. Let's do that. Um, so welcome to, to everyone joining us. I don't know how many you are, but to anyone joining, we're very glad to have you all here. We're so happy that you support us on Patreon. And we have received a number of questions. And the first one um, is from Sudin who is a supporter on Patreon, who write, wrote, I am from India, pursuing masters in psychology. I like to study psychoanalysis deeply. Can you suggest any books or courses? Also, can you provide a brief guidance on how to proceed from a, begin, from a beginner's level? And um, as you pointed out before, Nicholas, there is, um, we actually posted a video on reading recommendations a couple of weeks ago. And I will post this in the chat for all, for all of you to, um, to watch this later. We also have a Google document where we have listed all of these reading uh, recommendations and we will continue to, to add different kinds of recommendations to this list as time goes by. So it's definitely worth keeping, keeping an eye on. I will post it in the chat now. Oh, look, Sidin is here. He wrote in the chat. Hi, from India. Hello. Hello. <laughs> okay, I will post it in the chat. But I don't know, do you guys have any um, other, something else that you want to say regarding this question? I know, I know that India probably has three times as many people as Europe, and it's difficult to, to generalize. But there are psychoanalytic study groups and psychoanalytic societies there. And it is one of the places together with China, for instance, and Iran and Korea, where psychoanalysis is booming. So many colleagues and resources certainly can be discovered there. But I think it's an interesting, I don't know exactly about this person, you know, your background and such, but I think also the question from, let's say one gets interested in psychoanalysis, start to search online, find some videos from Berlin Psychoanalytic or others, start to get into this and, and, and slowly this idea starts to come to life that maybe this is something I want to spend more time with and research and maybe even become an analyst one day, you know, you know I'm just to think about that journey, how that could look or you know what are, what steps are involved in order to to become a psychoanalyst is it something that we that we feel like we covered well enough or, or, or should we add something to that um there is this um provide a brief guidance on how to proceed from a beginner level uh i was reading it also as what if you are a psychoanalyst because as Alexander points out, I think it's important to know that in India, it must not be that difficult if you are doing a master's level in psychology to find uh, people already working with psychoanalysis, being them in an association, but probably, uh, and even literature that is produced there uh, in different languages, I suppose, as well. Uh, but I was reading it as a question of like, why well, you are already a psychoanalyst, how do you proceed in psychoanalysis, once you are a psychoanalyst from this beginner level, because when you are a psychoanalyst, you're a, a psychoanalyst, you're a beginner psycho psychoanalyst. And there is this obvious answer of, well, by doing it, you know? uh, by practicing and uh, by being supervised, etc. But also I was thinking of the most formal things, the fact that associations and institutes of psychoanalysis have more experience psychoanalysts that have a particular function within most of the institutes that I know, which are like this didactic analysis, which is a different kind of analysis. I mean, I don't know how different in the in the day to day, I don't think too much, but it has a different status. The fact that an, an analyst in a certain institute is being analyzed is part of the training uh, but also the analyst who does it is probably an analyst that is there because of a certain reason of what we consider not a beginner level. What do you do you think the same? It's the same experience for you. After several years, I don't know 
how many in each institute, you have to present your clinical work or sometimes a theoretical paper, and then the elderly, so to say, vote whether you can become a training analyst or a training and supervising analyst. It is, I think, five or seven years. So it should show that you have worked all the time, had people in psychoanalysis and so on. It should show that you are not a beginner anymore. Is there anything like this in like more formal union analysis? Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I think I'm still a little bit stuck on my own question, maybe, because I think I, I take as a starting point the person who has no uh, background, who's just sort of just discovered psychoanalysis and sort of thinking about, yeah, this is something I want to go deeper into. Maybe this is something I would even want to practice one day. And I don't know if you agree with me, but I almost think so, that it would be a good start to go into analysis. If you haven't already, yeah, <laughs> I mean, of course, as a, as a starting point to, to, to experience that, because I think reading psychoanalysis and, and, and engaging it on that level it can be fascinating and intellectually stimulating and, and, and probably life changing in, 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 in one way. But, but, but to go into the experience of a psychoanalytic process, I mean, I guess that would be a starting point uh, in a way uh, in order to see and, and experience this, so to speak, live with your own material. I agree completely. Okay, so maybe let's uh, jump to the next question. Uh, this question is from Hanan, who is also a supporter on Patreon. I'm wondering what books, courses would you recommend for people who have a solid foundation about psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis as a treatment for mental disorders, but are more interested in psychoanalysis as a philosophical view of the world? I wrote something there in the in the where we have our questions written. Uh, yes. And I want to repeat what it says at the beginning that thing that I wrote, which is nice question. I like it. Uh, I, I am a I, I don't know if it's a fan, but uh, I think there are certain texts in philosophy and uh, uh, and and especially particularly that philosophy that deals with like more sociological aspects as well uh, that I think uh, are pretty good and I like them a lot uh, more postmodern philosophy uh, like the anti-Oedipus for example uh, of the uh, Luz and Gattari I don't know well how to pronounce it uh, and Eros and Civilization by Herbert Marcuse uh, who's part of the uh, the critical theory, the Frankfurt School uh, kind of uh, people who uh, do an analysis of thinking uh, as product of the social context a little bit. And uh, all with the, it's all very left-wing in terms of politics, but uh, uh, with the idea of uh, how is capitalism molding our ways of being among that's our minds and how psychoanalysis seems to be a very, very good uh, analogy, if you want, uh, or theoretical standpoint from which to from which to jump to these things. I think the concept of the unconscious uh, that in uh, that was popularized by Freud uh, and made into a working discipline uh, was not something that philosophers could now write as if that concept didn't exist anymore. So I think all philosophy from Freud ahead has changed because of the presence of that idea. Uh, but in person, I would like to just recommend that those two books to you uh, because I like them very much and because they take uh, this knowledge that you know have already about Freud and psychoanalysis and they use it in order to explain certain things of about thinking and epistemology and social the social condition, the human condition, even ontology, uh, because of those concepts, the deepest complex, the desire, etc. Also, the fact that Jack Sakan wrote and more than wrote, taught the way he taught and talked the way he talked, 
uh, and took uh, language so seriously, also gives uh, philosophy a super rich, uh, let's say, field of analogies and uh, it allows them to explain things in a, in a different way, uh, in the way that we relate to language. Uh, it's very important for philosophers as well. So I would say that I would recommend those two, but I think that every philosophy now that deals with uh, with the human condition has to include psychoanalysis somehow, even if it's not uh, directly or cited. What do you guys think? I'm sure about Frankfurt, many people would, would benefit from Adorno or even Eric Fromm. And I would just like to add two names from, so to say, from Paris. And one is Yulia Kristeva, and the other one is Paul Ricoeur, uh, who have written so much about psychoanalysis from the from the philosophical point of view or, or, or the interchange that I believe is useful for us as psychoanalysts very much. Well, wasn't also psychoanalysis Freud's philosophy of life? I mean, if we read Freud, we, we have to, it's, it's not only about clinical work, you know, I mean, a civilization and its discontent or Moses and Monophys or Totem and Taboo or you, you name it in a sense. There's so much in the archives starting from there uh, that I think I could almost not read Freud without sort of also reading philosophy or, or reading about him sort of philosophizing over the human condition. So I think there's a lot in the original sources. Um, since I'm a Jungian, you know, Jung was also keen on, on, on looking at culture in different ways and trying to understand, you know, the collective, not only the individual, but especially the individual in relationship to the collective. And I think there is one very topical, uh, timely essay uh, that he wrote uh, that's called Bhutan, that is uh, Jung trying to understand what happened during National Socialism. And uh, that uh, essay was also very criticized because, you know, sort of looking at missing, trying to psychologize maybe too much, you know, very complex phenomena that were going on. And, and Jung also not having a clear standpoint or taking a strong enough standpoint against National Socialism in that time, but, but still the essay in itself is an interesting attempt of you of trying to understand cultural forces that I think maybe are also active in the collective today as we're experiencing war again in Europe. There's another book by Jung that he wrote at the end of his life uh, that is uh, also dealing with, 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 with the matters of the individual and the individual uh, psyche in relationship to collective forces and that's called the undiscovered self it was a, a, a few years before he died he wrote it and it's sort of also one of his final pieces and that's really a, i think he presenting a philosophy of life and you know why is the work of analysis important you know given you know how the world is sort of challenged and and, and the individual you know psyche's relationship to the collective so these are just some sources but maybe we can fill up with some more later as well in the chat or yeah, another important name came to my mind, that is Donna Orange, a contemporary American, so to say, phenomenological psychoanalyst, who has a PhD in philosophy and only then turned to psychology and psychoanalysis. And her work is extremely important. Uh, she's published several books over the last 10 years that are, that are very important when it comes to how we care about ourselves, how we care about other people, how we listen to other people, and so on and so on. So that's another idea that came to my mind, Donna Orange. Okay, great. Um, let's continue with the next question. Um, Catherine, who is also a supporter and patron, she wants to know if you like Lacan, Alexander. <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> yes. I, I, of course, have never met Lacan. Uh, so I don't know whether I would like him. I would have liked him. Uh, I assume I wouldn't because from what I've seen of the recordings, there's so much theatricality and so much narcissism around it that I, I somehow um, don't watch this very gladly. 
when it comes to Lacanian theory, which I assume the question is actually about, uh, I would like to say, first of all, I find it strange that in psychoanalysis, we follow one author as a totem and we are Freudians, Lacanians, Kleinians, whatever. I find that completely unnatural. I understand that people have favorite pianists or favorite poets and so on, but in a profession that is partly focused on helping patients and partly focused on becoming a science, none of this, ha none of this helps. Following one author in our attempts to help each and every patient, I think is completely ridiculous because people need different things. And also many of these people, Lacan included, died several decades ago. The world has changed, the questions have changed, the problems have changed, some of the answers have changed. When it comes to Lacan individually, I find what I know of him to be an avalanche of words. There are so many words that sound very well. He seems to me like rather masterful in, in, in um, self-advertising, so to say. The unconscious is structured as a language. The unconscious doesn't have ears and such stuff. Sounds very interesting. I have no idea what it rests on what kind of a clinical, scientific, or whatever tests, valuation, confirmation, uh, or whatever this rests on. And then, most importantly, I have never met anyone who managed to show me, describe to me, what clinical use is there. And I don't think it fits my clinical experience. For instance, I have no idea who promised Lacan or who, whoever that the unconscious is structured in any way. Do we have any sort of, a, of evidence, soft or scientific or whatever, that the unconscious is, is, is structured in any way? This is, in my opinion, the opposite approach to what we discussed five minutes earlier. We discussed how psychoanalysis and philosophy and, and what could be the books that are useful there. Lacan claims that he returns to Freud. And in my impression, what he does actually is that he returns to Heidegger and that he reads the late Heidegger and his papers and his obsession with language, German romantic poetry, the man is being spoken, but the language speaks and so on and then pushes this into psychoanalysis and tries to found a philosophical psychoanalysis, which is quite fine. And some people certainly are, are very curious about it. I just don't see how that will help patients. But many other people disagree with me and I'm totally happy about that. In short, the answer is no. In short, the answer is doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, on the un one hand, I think we should learn from everyone in the world of psychoanalysis and focus on the patients first and foremost, listen to our patients far more than to our favorite authors. And second, I think Lacan and his theory have already fulfilled, I mean, reached their goal, and that is that everyone talks about Lacan. I see. So I'm not important that. What is, um, I was uh, thinking of the first part of the answer. I don't know if, how long do we have to stay in one topic? <laughs> you can you can comment and then we'll continue maybe. Of uh, this tendency of uh, psychoanalysts uh, or, or the history, of, I don't know, uh, this way of grouping that they have that is based on authors, uh, basically. Uh, and how this has brought about all this like more uh, uh, parts of the history of psychoanalysis that are in a way kind of important, but also in a bit, they, they shouldn't have happened, let's say, if you wanted to be a science, like the controversial discussions between Anna Freud and, and Klein, uh, 
about who's got the better explanation kind of thing. And I was thinking, who are these people that, um, I mean, it's Lacan, obviously, that we were talking, uh, Klein, Freud, Winnicott as uh, in the middle. Uh, who else could you add at that level? Like Beyond, no but more. Beyond would say he's a Kleinian, you know? I'm not sure about that. Kleinians would say that Beyond is a Klein. Uh -huh. Beyond became actually a prolific author and, and a creative thinker after Melanie Klein's death and when he left London for California and Brazil. This could be a coincidence, but we don't know. Uh, there's Stephen Mitchell more and more in the United States. Um, there is um, La Planche more and more. Then there are the Italians, Ferro and Civitarese. Uh, there is Ferenczi. Uh, posthumously, he, he was not as powerful a source at that time, but he is now. And what do you think makes, what is common about all these people? What, wait a second. Okay. <laughs> Didn't we miss someone? I'm sorry? Didn't we miss someone? I mean, we, we certainly have, have missed many. We I didn't miss, miss uh, the Swiss man. Was, uh... Yeah, of course. Jung and uh, yeah. Anna Freud, we didn't mention. And there must be many of them, yes. I think it's important. Yeah. Uh, my, my question was, what do you think is common to all these authors? <clears throat> that they have a good idea? Or is something about the, the the way of structuring the idea? Is Klein someone that changes the way that we think about psychoanalysis as a method and a metaphor and a theoretical explanation because she adds not only one element to it, but changes the way of, of seeing it? Uh, they offer I, a new method in a way? I mean, if the question is for me, I think for anyone. Most, most of these people had a very intense desire to be powerful, to be seen as charismatic, to be seen as changing the history, and worked like politicians or like Savonarola, if you will, on establishing these cults. For instance, we didn't mention either Fabern or Bowlby, who both had nothing to do with this lived their lives, did their research, treated their patients, were never part of these fights. And we know what happened to, to the two of them while they were alive. I think there is obviously creativity, intelligence and such stuff, and they have changed something about how we see the world of psychoanalysis now, but there is this desire to establish themselves as a cult figure. Again, I may be wrong. I've never met any one of them. Just I believe there are historical documents that show this. Okay. Uh, anything else that you guys want to say, or can we continue? Continue. Okay. So the next question is also from Catherine. Uh, do you think there is a minimum length of analysis one should undergo oneself before committing to training? Uh, well, um, and, uh, there are some institutes that actually ask you for a minimum mm. to study. Uh, there are others that don't. Uh, so uh, a part of what we could recommend now in the rest of the answer, uh, there are some institutes that actually make this question that you asked, Catherine. Uh, they resolve it for you because they tell you how much do you need. Uh, then after that, uh, I don't know, uh, do you have any comments on this? Would you recommend a length of analysis before starting to study to be an analyst? Well, like can you say that in Zurich, for example, you need to have 50 sessions uh, with an analyst who is within the IAAP uh, before uh, applying to, to training? And I think it's, yeah, I think it's necessary to have had 
an experience of analysis, how long it should be exactly, I, I don't know. I, I remember having heard about this, but I cannot tell you what the purpose of this should be. Uh, that, that, that one should know what it looks like, and then if you want to change your mind, change it before you start the training, or what do you guys think is the purpose of this? Uh, I, I, think, I think that it is to have the experience, of course, because if you read psycho, psychoanalysis, even if you read what is published of sessions, they are one session among so many sessions in one moment sometimes. I mean, you're not going to read a full analysis. There are yeah. some read, but you know what's going to do. That. Uh, you need to see what this is about. In, uh... The thing is, like, of course, you not only get the experience of analysis, you get the experience of a certain analyst, which mm -hmm. it's also a thing. Uh, I mean, the idea would be to do a little bit of <laughs> shopping. But then again, if, especially if you have a reason why you think that uh, going to psychoanalysis or psychotherapy might be good for you, then start with that. Um, and and then you see if you like if you'd like to do what what you're experiencing mm. of course. Yeah. okay so the third question from Catherine is um i thought i saw a comment uh during a previous q a it was the ama that we did a couple of years ago to do with greater efficacy of psychoanalysis if one is in it for 18 months minimum. In cases of childhood trauma and adult attachment, would there be an advisable duration or does it just ultimately depend on the patient case? Okay, of that question, uh, when it says, does it just ultimately... Uh... Depend uh, on the patient or case. That's a, a bit of a dodgy uh, part of the question because in outcomes in general of not only psychoanalysis, but psychotherapy in general, it just don't only depend on any one thing. So uh, everything that we might say now, you have to take it with that pinch of salt that we're just explaining one of the many ways that we don't know them all of uh, why uh, psychoanalysis or psychotherapy works. And one of them is length. Uh, what I know is that uh, in terms of what has been done uh, with empirical research about this, and empirical research take into account that counts that psychoanalysis works when the problem is not there anymore. So when you don't have symptoms anymore. Mm -hmm when uh, psychoanalysis might be, a, of course, it's a, it's a way of treating symptoms in many ways as well. It might be longer uh, than that because uh, other things continue that not, doesn't necessarily count as symptoms in empirical research, which get their symptoms from the DSM and other psychiatric kind of ways, classifications. Okay? So yes, psychoanalysis, if it's longer, seems to work, work better. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that advantage in, uh, in getting rid of symptoms uh, is just slightly better for the longer analysis. So the question remains of uh, if it's benef cost beneficial and not only talking about money here, but it's a lot of time uh, that a patient might invest in this. Uh, so... Uh, is it good or bad? It's, it's a question of where are you asking this from? If you are a government and you have a public system of health, uh, how is better? What is better? If it's shorter or if it's a bit more profound, are you going to pay for that little bit, for example? Uh, I think that the, the suggestion that you do that, it depends on the patient and case, is very important as well. It's not the only one either. Uh, but uh, it is important that uh, different patients are going to react differently, and depending not only on, on their problem, but in the way that that patient is, and, and the way that the treatment takes place, etc. Uh, 
that's with respect to the duration of psychoanalysis. Then uh, there are two opposing groups here in, in empirical research about uh, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Uh, one that says that it doesn't do any different and another says that it makes a difference. So, um, and there is good evidence in both uh, sides. So what is established right now is that there is a difference. It's better if it's longer, but not that much better. It's not a big difference. It's not that your analysis is double the time. You're gonna be a double as well, double better. I would just like to say, it seems to me once the treatments have started and let's say it's two years into the analysis, it is not going to depend on whether the analyst and the patient together, whether they think this can improve and that cannot improve and they make a rational plan. I think it's the issue of separation then. Separation anxiety is the negotiation of how we separate, where it hurts, for how long it hurts and so on. So I, I wouldn't say, I, I understand researchers of course approach the problem rationally, but mm -hmm. clinicians um, don't have the luxury to do that very often, I'm afraid. Well, I would also just shortly speak from, from my experience of, as a clinician, you know, one of the few things that I say often quite clearly in, in the first meeting with the potential new patient is that this is a, a longer term process. And what I can say, what works in my experience of the people I met what works if, is if you stick with it. And when I say stick with it, 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 yeah, it needs a year or two and sometimes more to be really effective. That's mm -hmm. where I see people really changing. Mm -hmm. Not, that doesn't mean that you have to marry the process from the beginning, but it's important to set the expectation. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I can say clearly, like the people where I see that type of change, it needs some yeah, time in that range. Mm -hmm. um. Can I ask how long were your analysis? Is that like a personal question? Oh, I wish I could tell you precisely. Uh, I was for a year and a half, two or three sessions a week, and then officially in training, four sessions a week for six or seven years. But it was long ago. I cannot. I cannot now tell you exactly. Um, I think around 1100 sessions. I don't know the exact number, but I know there's a number for how many sessions you have to do in order to finish the training in Zurich. And you also, you're recommended at least to meet with two and work with two different analysts throughout the training, preferably also one of each of the different gender. But that's, uh, yeah, this is a, I cannot say exactly how many years it is, but it's been quite some. Yeah. I did three and a half years with between three and four sessions a week. And I say between because it would vary. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, and I don't, and I'm back now with my same analyst. Yeah. Online? So, online. Uh, we're doing not analysis anymore. Psychoanalytic like psych therapy, let's say, but not, not because of a symptom, but I thought because I'm working more, more, with, more with clients and because of, um, yeah, just wanted to get married and that kind of personal mm -hmm. stuff. But, uh, just psychoanalytic psychotherapy, but it works pretty similarly in many ways. Uh, I meant, meant to ask you, does, does online make a difference for you? Because from the first session to the last week, I was on the couch all the time. And I cannot tell whether there is a difference. I haven't systematically thought about that, but I was also in the couch since the uh, analyst, my analyst decided that it was time to go to the couch. Uh, in, in, so it was like, I don't know, a month or a month and a half uh, talking one-to-one uh, -one in front of him. And then I didn't see him anymore, let's say during the analysis time. Uh, 
Uh, and now, I don't know, actually. I, uh, it does make a difference that it's just once a week, for example. Uh, that is a big difference. Um, it, before, it was much more to the detail, to the day, to the etc. When you, you, you can continue sometimes sessions. Uh, and that in that way is it's quite different. I mean, I end a session with uh, uh, something that I want to explore about myself or in my relationships with an idea about something or with a relief about something. By the time I have the next session next week, uh, it's very different of what I had pictured my next session would have been when I finished this, mm. the previous session. I don't know if I, that was clear. Uh, yes. Many things will happen. Yeah. Uh, that it makes a big difference. That the, the fact that he's online, I think, well, I can see his face, let's say, but usually I'm kind of not doing that. Mm. Uh, maybe because I had the experience of couch analysis before. So my, I just wonder and I end up always looking at the same point like I used to do when I was there. Uh, and then at some point, of course, I'm going to ask myself, why am I looking at that point and not the point next to it? Like in analysis. Uh, but I see that something happens with his face, that he can work with his face a bit more as well. Uh, so sometimes he doesn't uh, have to say anything, but just go like, you know, oh, et cetera. And you would get that he's kind of signaling something. Uh, but I'm going to think about this more. Uh, if it makes any difference to me as a patient also, uh, as I tell you, it's not that I'm expecting to solve a certain kind of precise symptom that I have. And if your analyst is watching us, he can write his comment in the chat. <laughs> yeah, he could do. Hello. <laughs> Well, I mean, some of the feedback I get from patients as well, and also from yeah, from colleagues and friends who are in analysis or therapies. Of course, the, the the ritual around the actual session or going there, commuting, going back, you know, that missing that or you know how much that has been a part or becomes a part of the actual analytic process. Everything around that versus yeah, logging in and getting right into the session. I think that uh, that is a radical difference that we all have to deal with in different ways. Okay, so next question is from Helian on Instagram. Um, she wants to know how to apply for a psychoanalytic training program, requirements, etc. And she also wonders if we um, offer a psychoanalytic training program and we do not do this. We um, don't offer it, uh, but we offer, as you know, the educational videos and um, applying for a psychoanalytic training program. I guess that's uh, a bit different when it comes to country to country. Maybe you could uh, um, share your experiences. From well, I, I assume it is, it is rather similar with, mm. with possibly some specificities. Mm -hmm. um, one must be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, in some countries a social worker, in the United States a PhD nurse also accepted, and should preferably have some clinical experience. If not, these things have to be compensated for so to say one must during the training uh, take some psychology courses or uh, do an internship at the psychiatric hospital or some other sort of mental health institution other than that i'm not aware of any other requirements that's are it. there mm -hmm. i think that's it uh... People who do not have this requirements, uh, especially when it comes to degrees, that changes a little bit country to country. Uh, but uh, for example, in Chile, you could 
studied in an institute, but uh, not the you don't see patients. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can study. Yeah. There, there are are these options at various places to have a training to be something like a researcher, an author, but not a clinical part of the training. It's similar in, in Zurich. Uh, I mean, you don't have to go to Zurich to train to be union, but that's where I have my experience. It's similar, but with the difference that you can apply also with a master from other fields. You don't have to be a psychologist, trained psychologist to apply. Although I would say that the majority are. Uh, and there's also this, uh, uh, you have to be 28 or if it's 27 years uh -huh. old, there's an uh -huh. age. Uh -huh, okay. And I know also there is a, you have to write a, not a biography, but like any not a motivation uh -huh. letter, but like uh -huh. an essay actually that you, where you speak about yourself and what leads you mm -hmm. to this decision. Okay, that's and then there's, a, then there's a committee or uh, yeah, three people that are sort of with you through the whole training mm -hmm. and that are also evaluating the, the progress uh, of, of your, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, how they perceive it. Um, Throughout the whole training, you can also be, you have to sort of meet with them and see if you can get to the next step. But that might be, will be very different in, in, in other countries. And again, there's very good training programs also for unions in the UK, in London, and in Chicago, and also in New York and in other places. Okay. So the next question is from Tobia pa, Tobia Paminio Nicolo. Um, why is Silvio Fanti's micropsychoanalysis not a member of IPA? Um, or maybe why is Silvio Fanti not a member of IPA? I have never heard the name before. I mean, has anyone? Yeah, there's no. Okay. Well. Um, and the next question is from the same user on Instagram, and they like to know why are, um, Freud and Jung are more famous than Adler, or more popular, or, or, yes. Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to reply. There are Adlerian institutes. There is definitely one in Berlin. So his influence still exists. Why are the two other guys more popular? I don't know. They were, they were possibly better in promoting themselves and gathering a group of followers or groups of followers. Well, they have just had better ideas. Well, I'm not sure, but also why and, and how actually, but I think it has a lot to do with the followers and what you said before, Alexander, about organizing, sort of structuring, you know, a moment of mm -hmm. sorts. I mean, that's what's very telling when you read the letter exchange between Jung and Freud. Mm -hmm. Most of it is about politics and talking yep. about other analysts. Yeah. But there's also something about the relevance of ideas, you know, and how they fit to with the zeitgeist, of course. And, uh, some old prophets are awakened again and there's new moments starting. So, and speaking of Jung, you know, me speaking of Jung, he's always gone in and out of fashion, you know. Suddenly there's an interest, like now there's more interest, but then there are years where he's almost like persona non grata and in the academic, he's absolutely still not acceptable in any way. Almost. Adler was the first psychoanalyst to publish a paper about what is called the death drive. And that was, I believe, in 1907. And Freud couldn't care less. And Adler then was kicked out for other reasons. And then 13 years later, there it is, Freud writes about the death drive, Adler nowhere mentioned. So there are various, various problems about that. But again, I, I would advocate the approach that we should filter and, and absorb the best of their ideas, test it against what is needed in our time, and go on, scientific development. I mean, think of going to a dentist and he approaches your tooth 
from the Adlerian point of view. I assume every one of us would run away. Okay. Um, wait, 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 wait. I know, but uh, maybe we're too slow. <laughs> too think. slow? Yeah. I mean, in what sense? Because I wanted to propose something branching out of that question, uh, but it, it was too, it's too much. But just this sense of, uh, again, following the same, uh, this one author classifying oneself, etc. cetera. Uh, and why is Freud or Jung more famous than Adler? Does it have to do with the patients again? Uh, or with this drive that you comment Alexander on uh, promoting themselves? Or do, do they write nicer? Or do this has to do with the, uh, with, it's, it's more efficacious to read for the patients to read Freud or Jung than to read Adler. Um, what do you think about that? Because it, it talks a bit about the potentials of truth or science or psychoanalysis. I know it's difficult for me to say. Um, psychoanalytic books globally sell several hundred copies at best. So there are no psychoanalysts now who are in bestseller lists who, like Eric Fromm, can reach millions of people around the globe. Um, so I don't really know. And this all happened like 100 years ago. I don't even know when Adler died. Freud died in 1939. I, I admire their questions. I'm not sure their answers are so relevant for our times. So I honestly don't know. It's a, it, it could be a long discussion. This one. You know, Adler, as far as I can remember and understand, writes a lot about power. And then is it possible that the power as a topic is now absorbed by the topic of narcissism and has disappeared in there so that invisible Adler is with us all the time, but we just don't, we're not aware of his name? I don't really know. And, yeah. and this idea of power appears uh, counter mainstream or, or, or let's say not Freudian because it came to challenge sex, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Freud wouldn't allow anyone to, to touch uh, the idea of the dominance of sex drive. And, and now we know he was not right about that. Mm. Well, also, I mean, I haven't read much Adler, but how I understand uh, uh, power, I understand it in the context of freedom, how to live, how to become free, how to live, you know, I, I find, as I understand him, he's speaking about power and willpower and he connects to Nietzsche, but mm -hmm. it's really about, you know, how to live free or and also how to develop a philosophy of life to, 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 to allow more freedom. So I, I find, uh, you know, for me, it's just a, a constant, uh, relationship between these ideas and, and the collective, you know, how the collective develops. I mean, let's look at Jung. Why did he, when I started training, you know, more than 10 years ago, it was 12 years ago, he was extremely out of fashion, to put it simple. He was in most places and, and in Sweden, you couldn't even mention his name. And now 12 years later, I mean, he's not on the, on the front on, of the newspapers, but he's an accepted part of the cult, collective discourse again. You can talk about him. Podcasters want to, you know, research him. There are papers written. Again, not in the academia, but, you know, outside of the academia or on YouTube or in, in the common discourse. And I find that so interesting, you know, how these ideas continue to live or other aspects of their work is emphasized, for example, and, and lift up again. I think that's, that's very rich and to see how, because for me, that's a, a constant interplay between how a collective and the country at large develops. Okay, let's continue with the question that um, Sadin posted. Um, I like to know your opinion on intensive short-term dynamic psych psychotherapy developed by Devan Lu. I don't know anything about it. So it's a very specific question. I can I can tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's a short-term therapy based on psychoanalysis and the ideas of um, 
defense mechanisms and, and the fact that uh, uh, you uh, develop uh, symptomatic or just maladaptive strategies in order to deal with certain feelings that uh, you haven't, you don't want to know you have. This is kind of what takes off of psychoanalysis. A big, I'm doing this super fast. It's like uh, in the treatment of phobia, uh, this, this short term, uh, psycho, uh, uh, how is it, uh, psychodynamic therapy, dynamic therapy, uh, to psychoanalysis, the relationship between the two is the same of in cognitive psychotherapy for phobias, having a progressive desensitization against shock therapy. So it accelerates things and needs people who can tolerate a lot of anxiety. Uh, and they head on goes, oh, so you are uh, not feeling well saying this. So how are you? I'm, I'm awkward, but now, but why? You know, and it interrogates the defense a lot. And it's like very intense. And it, it works like many, many, many other psychoanalytic psychotherapies that they are. Um, it happens that they get they get named by the person who kind of comes with this form to use psychoanalytic ideas or that other form. And then it seems like if they were different things. Uh, when we talk about CBT, it's also an illusion. I mean, there is a thousand CBTs, no? Uh, with psychoanalysis also, we have a thousand ways of utilizing these ideas in which of, of which psychoanalysis is kind of the one where we know, the more classical, but psychoanalytic psychotherapy, there are many, many different kinds. And many of them, all of them work. Uh, and this is one of the ones that work, but it works uh, for symptoms, so psychiatric symptoms. And uh, they got a lot of, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty circumscribed in the sense that you wouldn't treat people with, uh, moderate to more difficult depression with that. Uh, you wouldn't treat psychosomatics with that. Uh, it's got anxiety and uh, social problems or uh, relational problems as, as uh, where it works. Uh, so it's good. <laughs> it's good that these ideas have been used in many, many different ways that are might be useful for people. Uh, that's it, but it's the same opinion I would give you with most of the names you could tell me of different psychoanalytic psychotherapies. I would go to read a little bit about them, uh, what is the rationale, and if there is any, uh, in my case, I always go to, what well, does this work, empirical research uh, or accounts of, uh, uh, or, or case studies, but a couple of them. And I would see if, uh, if there are people who say that uh, it works for them. So. Uh, I'm glad that they're based in psychoanalysis, but you know, you will find which one uh, works for you as a therapist, I suppose, or because you are in contact with a certain group of people or because you live in a certain place uh, or because you went to a certain university where the inventor of one of these therapies was working. Uh, but in the end, um, what is interesting would be to try to see why all this works, why all these different psychotherapists work. And this is a in concluded, it's not a conclusive uh, answer we can give there, but they work and there are thousands of therapies with names that work. That's my opinion on it. <laughs> Super. Um, okay. Uh, Salain, Salain Incognita on Instagram wants to hear some comments on the integration of psychoanalysis with psychiatric medication and your opinions on that. Well, no psychiatrists here, no medical doctors here. I'm not sure we can say much. Um, uh, what your experience? I've never been on medication either, so <laughs> I don't have much experience. Uh, you have patients who, or you've had patients that were... Also yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, I think reactions are completely different i've seen people who benefited hugely from a minor dosage of antidepressants without any major side effects and i've seen people who have suffered from various symptoms headaches somatic symptoms and so on from 
equally small dosage of antidepressants. So it's difficult for me to say. At the time when I worked in the psychiatric hospital, I think a benefit from medication was obvious sometimes. More often, I would say, with younger people than with chronic patients. But I was not able to understand then, and I cannot understand now, why medication is prescribed to such a large groups of people and for decades. And the last thing I want to say, but this is all impressions. This is, this is nothing really serious. Uh, I was privileged to speak with Anne Louise Silver several times over like 10 years. And she used to work at Chestnut Lodge for several decades before they used any medication and after they introduced medication. So at the time when they work with psychotic patients with the use of psychoanalysis only and then in combination. And in her opinion, patients who use, who are given medication and agree to it, recover faster from their symptoms and can be discharged from the hospital, but in the long run will not develop a meaningful sense of life, creative expression, and so on. While people who undergo psychoanalytic treatments for psychosis, which can take years and be extremely complicated and so on, will, I mean, it's implicitly present in what I'm saying, will require a lot of time to improve, but their lives then will make much more sense. And the case of the novel, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, is uh, one that is very often used to illustrate this. But, but this, is, this should not be taken very seriously. These are just some impressions. Uh, Jakub? I don't have anything to add actually to this. I think, uh, I, yeah, nothing specific to add to this. I am, I am of the opinion that if it works, it's good. Meaning that if the person feels better, uh, it's, it's good. Now, uh, that might be taken a little bit like, you know, a, a bit like short term, but better in the long term. So I consider that what Alexander says is, is perfect. But on the other hand, I know that uh, there might be a certain uh, uh, resistance uh, from uh, taking the psychoanalytic theory, let's say, and saying, well, if the person cannot confront their symptoms because they've been relieved by, um, a pill, can they ultimately change psychoanalytically? Uh, as if a proper psychoanalysis would be in counterindication with the use of something that is uh, symptomatic, let's say. As you were saying, people stop taking a medication and they will relapse, or many of them uh, might relapse, have higher uh, odds of relapse. Uh, what do you think about that side of psychoanalytic? Theory that if you don't have the suffering, then why would you be even motivated to do anything? I mean, I think there's a truth to that, but I mean, not a dead truth, but I think there's definitely in individual cases, you know, in most cases, I would say, we, I mean, we need to confront suffering, but in in some cases, and I also have experience of that, of course, antidepressant has been helpful because it's been too painful or too difficult to get out of bed or what it can be. So I have a very, I find in, in sometimes, uh, I'm generalizing, but I think mean sometimes in the union discourse at least, there's a negative view on antidepressants and this type of medication because it would somehow uh, you know, pamper down feelings or not giving access and such. I haven't experienced that much of that, although, yeah, I haven't experienced much of that in, in my, processes, but I, I think often if, if the process goes well, that the antidepressants are also, you know, decreased or, or often, you know, something that sort of reveals yeah, that has, we can let go of throughout the process. I think 
we should give medication to some people at some moments. It is probably for some people necessary, but ideally I think we should give them for a short time and introduce other measures that would make the person more independent. But then the same thing can be said about psychotherapy. Some people need psychotherapy, but maybe for a limited time, and then with the help of something else, their friends or whatever, they can become independent, more independent than being in psychotherapy for 10 years or 25 years. Uh, the, the, person, the person to read about this, I believe, I'm not sure, I've never read books about medication psychoanalysis, but I think the person to read about this is Glenn Gabbard. Yeah, good recommendation. Okay, so it's five o'clock. Um, so we should wrap this up. There is another question in the in the comments. Don't know if you if you have time to answer that one. Uh, it's Sudin who wants to know. I'd like to ask one more question. In your opinion, is it possible to prove psychoanalytic concepts neurologically? Is there any such developments? <laughs> Well, there are great hopes <laughs> and, and their attempts. Uh, possibly, again, to, to recommend the source, possibly it's the journal Neuropsychoanalysis. And I mean, there must be other journals as well. The Mind and the Inner World is a good book. Yeah. And quite, it's not complicated. Yeah by Mark Solms, considered one of the pioneers of neuropsychoanalysis. Mm. Mm. It, it depends. I mean, what do you want to... It depends on the concept. I mean, there are many concepts which are no oper operationalization. It's already impossible. I have... I don't want to, to, to sound discouraging, but I have about a year ago started reading papers by Professor Thomas Fuchs, who is now the Carl Jaspers Professor of Philosophy of Psychiatry in Heidelberg. And they seem to me to, to, to put this discussion, brain, mind, and, and, and what we can hope from neuropsychological research or neuroscientific research to the best place I've seen so far. So, so that's another reading recommendation that I can make. What is his name again? Thomas Fuchs. Okay. Okay, so um, I suggest that we wrap it up. Uh, anything? Thomas Fuchs, yeah, can now that's um, is there anything else you would like to, to say or share today? Or... Thank you. Thank you for the questions and support and interest. Yes, thank you so much for joining and for your support. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to creating more videos in the, in the time to come and hopefully engaging more live streams with you as well. Uh, but for now, have a good weekend and uh, see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.